So welcome to lecture number uh, 10. So first um, I will go through the school learning again. And then in the second part of this lecture, I will talk about unsupervised learning and so-called uh, k-means clustering algorithm, which you should implement in homework number three. Um, so recall that um, after doing a lot of examples here in the supervised learning world, um, we started last time talking about reinforced learning. And uh, we had this example with this um, car, but also we had this example with the campus and the lecture hall in Combini. And I will mention this again today and then later talk a little bit about this. And then in the second part, we go here to the clustering, which is part of unsupervised learning. So what was the this basic idea for this reinforcement learning? So um, in com comparison to supervised learning, so in the case of supervised learning, we had some trainings uh, data where we always had a feature and a label. So we had some supervisor who told the program um, what these things are. So it gave an example um, of a picture of a dog and it said, this is a dog and so on. And in the reinforcement world, there's no a supervisor, but there's just a program who tries and to interact with the environment and then it gets a reward from the environment and new states. So we have this program here or the machine or the robot, which we call the agent and this agent can do some action. And then the environment, whatever this means, will give back some reward and also a new state. Yeah. So in the chess example, the agent is maybe the chess program. Then an action is to, to move a chess piece. Then the environment is the other chess player who will also uh, receive your move and then will um, react to your move and will give back a new state, meaning a new uh, chess board where he also put a piece. And at this point, when he's playing, you don't get a reward. But at some point, you maybe make the the final winning move, and then you get the reward by winning, or the environment, meaning the opponent makes a, the final move, and then you get a negative reward by losing the game. And this general setup um, is usually described by this Markov decision process, um, which was a thing of four things. So we had a set S, a set A. So we had the set S, the um, the set of states. Then we had the set A, which was a set of action. And then T and R were two maps. Um, so this T was this uh, transition probability function, which told us the probability that if we are in some state S and in some, and then take some action A, that we will land in some action in some state S. Um, the value of this function. Um, at these three points um, tells us the probability that um, going from one state to the other state by using the action A. Um, but in a lot of examples, um, if we are in some certain state and we do a certain action, then often there's actually just one possible state. For example, in our uh, lecture hall Combini example, and if we move in one direction, then I'm starting in one state and going up there's just one possible state we can land in. So in this case, um, these probabilities are always, um, almost always zero, except for always uh, one um, state. Yeah, and um, then R is the reward function, which tells us uh, what, what do we get when we go from one state to the other state by using a certain action. And this will be a real number, which, um, by a positive real number usually means some positive reward and a negative number means some negative reward. And so then we had this, uh, this example here and um, with this uh, robot car, which wants to travel far and quickly. And there were three different states. So the set S um, was a set of three elements namely the set, uh, the elements were cool, warm, and overheated. And there were two different actions this car can do. It can slow down or it can uh, speed up. 
And then we see here in this picture, these um, transition probability probabilities. So for example, here going from the state cool um, to the state warm um, using the action going faster, the probability um, is 50% or staying in the same state um, is also 50%. And going faster gives a reward of two and going slow um, gives a reward of one. But here, um, if we are already in the state warm and we go fast, then our car overheats and we get a reward of minus 10. Yeah? Okay. And um, so how do these dynamics of such a system usually look like? So usually we will start in some state S, S0. So for example, we start in the state cold and then we choose an action, for example, going faster. And then we get a new state, which is maybe, um, again, we are still cool or we go to the, the warm state with a certain probability. And maybe what was confusing last time that um, here I talk about um, an explicit example of um, going from one state to another. So here I will start with, so this is, a, let's say, one episode of a program. So I start in one explicit state, then choose an action and get one explicit state back. Um, so it's not that at this point here, I consider all possible uh, states at the same time. So this here really describes one explicit way. Yeah, and going to the state from S0 to S1 gives us a, a number, a reward, going from S0 to S1 using action A0. And this um, we do again and again, we choose an action and so on and get a reward back. And what we in the end get as a reward is the sum of all of these rewards on our way through the program. And um, so this is a so-called total reward. And we also have this, uh, this discount factor, um, which can be interpreted as a, um, a factor, which somehow um, makes the early rewards more important. So if this number uh, gamma here is one, then I just have the sum of all rewards I get at each step. But if, if the gamma is smaller than one, then um, the, the later rewards um, which takes some time until I get them, and um, they are less important. And of course, the goal is um, to choose an action here such that we can increase um, this total reward. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and choosing actions is what we call a policy. So if we are in a certain state, for example, we are cool or warm, then a policy tells us what we should do in this certain state. So a policy is a function from the possible states to the possible actions. And then the goal of um, um, the goal of our program is to find the, the optimal policy which will increase our total reward. And here was maybe the first confusing formula. Um, which is now the, the value of a policy pi. Um, so the statement is that this is a function on the space on the set S. So I can get the value for each state and the value of a policy at a state S is this here. And what this means um, is that we take the expected value um, because now we consider all possible cases. Um, so if we are in a certain state, then doing an action um, can lead to different states with certain probabilities. Um, so what I want to consider here is the expected value considering all possible ways of going from one state to the next. So that's why we need to, to choose the expected value here. Yeah. And what this here means is that we consider this total 
or this discounted total reward by starting um, in the state S and we take the expected value. Because starting in S0, um, the S1 uh, is, uh, can have different values. So with certain probabilities, S1 could be either this state, this state, or this state. And what we want is to consider all these possible rewards we can get going in all these different um, states. And we want to get the expected value of this by choosing the action um, um, using this policy here. So if we are in a, in a certain state SJ, then the action we choose um, is determined by our policy. Yeah. But for example, in our Combini lecture example, we actually don't need the, the expected value here because in this case, um, it's clear if I start in one state and choose an action, then there's just one possible state. So there's actually really just the sum of these things here. And we don't need to take the uh, expected value. And what this number here really just means um, is this interpretation here Namely that if I, um, if I have fixed a policy, a way of deciding, then the value of this policy at some state S um, is the expected total reward I can get by starting in this state, choosing this policy. Yeah. So are there questions on this notion? Okay, and, and then we introduce what we called an optimal policy. So a policy, so an optimal policy we denote by pi uh, star. And this is defined to be the policy which maximizes this, uh, this value. So meaning um, that this has this property here that this value of this optimal policy at any state so the, um, the expected total reward I can expect by starting in state S is given by the, the maximum of all possible values over all possible uh, policies. Yeah, and in, in this car example, it is quite um, clear what the optimal policy was um, because of course we want to go, usually we always want to go fast but of course, if we are warm, we don't want to go fast because with 100%, um, we have um, a reward of minus 10. So therefore, uh, clearly the optimal policy of, of warm should always be slow. But of course, if we are in cool state and we want to maximize our value, then we always want to go fast because we get um, these uh, two rewards instead of going slow. So therefore, the, the value or the, the image of the state cool um, of the optimal policy here is fast. Yeah, so in this example, it's quite clear what the optimal uh, policy looks like. <clears throat> okay, and um, and of course, the goal is to find the optimal um, policy. Um, but of course, um, it's quite hard to find it by considering all possible uh, policies. Um, so we first rephrase this a little bit by using this, this so-called uh, state action value function. And I will try to make this really explicit in our Combini example. And I hope then um, this becomes clear. So what this function here is, this we denoted by Q star. Um, so this function here, Q star, is a map from S times A to R. So for each state and each action, um, this gives a number. And um, this number tells us the expected total reward we get when we are in state S and we choose action uh, A. So this here, this Q star SA, um, we 
So we are in state S and we take action A um, using the, the optimal policy. And um, so if we are in, in some state S and choose action A, then the reward we get at the immediate step is um, um, this one here. We are in state S, we take action A and we go to um, state S prime. And the probability of going to S prime is given by this transition probability function here. Yeah. So therefore this here gives us exactly the, the expected value of the immediate reward because we take the probabilities of going of landing in in some state s prime and multiply it with the reward we get when we land in in the state s prime so this is the expected value for the immediate reward and then afterwards um, we take um, we want to know what are the next rewards um, and therefore what we do is um, we, um, we take this sum here. So again, we take the um, probability of landing in um, state S prime. And then from S prime, the, the expected total reward is exactly um, this function here because the value of the optimal policy of S prime is exactly what we can expect um, as a total reward when starting in S prime. Yeah, I don't know. Is is this function maybe clearer? I hope at least it will be when we do it in our example. Um, but the main point here is, um, assuming we know this function here, um, then we can also get back um, the optimal policy, um, because um, the optimal policy then. If I want to know what should I do when I'm in state S, well, I just need to, to check what is the, the largest value of this um, state action value function when starting in S. So for which action does this value here give me the, the biggest expected reward? And then um, the corresponding action, which gives me the highest value here, should be then the, the value of this optimal policy. Yeah. Okay, so now let's do an explicit examples with numbers and try to understand this function Q. So we had this example here, this uh, silly example of Convini lecture. So um, the, the setup is that we are uh, on the campus and there are different positions where we can be. And on the, so the different states are the positions on the campus. So in this case, there are uh, 56 positions. And there are also some special states, namely uh, the, the green parts are combinis and the red parts are lecture halls. And there are four possible actions going right, up, left, and down. And the reward we get by entering a green cell is plus one because we want to go to a combini but entering a red cell gives us minus one and making just one step to an empty cell is a minus one. Now, yeah, because just walking is, uh, makes us uh, tired. And the, uh, what we want is to find the starting somewhere and we want to find the shortest way to the next uh, combini. And um, so for example, here, um, we had this example of an optimal policy. So here we can see in each state um, what the optimal policy is. So if this here is state S, then the statement here is that pi star of this S in this case is the action um, going left, right? Because the policy is a function from S to A. And A is a set of, of these four directions. But now let's uh, make really clear what we mean by this uh, state action uh, value function. So, so let's 
take a, a smaller example. So let's say we just have these four states and one of them um, is, the, uh, is the Combini. And now, so in this case, maybe let's give them name S, S prime, S two prime, oops, and S three prime. So we have four states and we still have the same actions. So we can go in, in all directions. Or well, let's just say A is up, left, down, right. Yeah. And this um, state action value function now gives us for each state here and each action, so here at each point, this gives us a value, yeah? So the, here we have the value Q star S, let's say going up. And what is the value in this case? Um, well, we want to know, um, I mean, we can use this formula here so, um, uh, so what is the, the expected maximal reward we can get by starting here and going in this direction? Well, the best way to go to a combini is to go in the next step there, right? So therefore, in this case, so maybe let's first do this term here. What is the immediate reward by going this step here? Well, in this case, we go to an empty cell. So the immediate reward is just minus one. So this here is the value of this is uh, minus 0 0.1, sorry, because uh, we have this uh, making a step to an empty cell is minus 0 0.1 plus, and then we have this term here and now we need to look um, when we are in this state here um, we need to find um, the, the, the maximal. Uh, um, so first of all, um, we are, there's just one summit here because um, uh, going from there to there, we will just end in one state. And now from here, we want to know what is the maximal expected reward. And this one is um, when we go in this direction here, we would get plus one. Yeah, because going here, well, I should say that in this case, we maybe just say, if we go in this direction, we, uh, we go back on the same. So this here would give minus 0 0.1 and minus 0 0.1. But going this step here would give us plus one. So therefore, in this case, um, this here, um, maybe let's write this explicitly. So this, so this S prime is really this S prime here. Um, the maximal expected reward we get is one because we can go there by using the optimal policy going left. So this here is one. And that's why in this case here, we add one. Yeah. So in this case, this here is 0 0.9. So somehow here we have the, maybe let's make this with the color. So here we have 0 0.9 as the value of our state action value function for this state going in this direction, yeah? And with the same argument, um, because this is somehow symmetric, we also have 0 0.9 um, going to the left. But for this state going to the right, um, which in this example um, goes back to this state here, um, we lose 0 0.1 because uh, going to an empty cell gives us an Im immediate reward of 0 0.1. So here, this Q star of S going to the right is the immediate reward of 0 
and minus 0 0.1 plus but then from there um, we know the um, um, the so we know that the, the value the optimal the value of the, of the optimal policy of s is uh, 0 0.9 yeah so therefore here we have um, 0 0.9 So therefore, this is 0 0.8. So here, the value of the action, the state action value function is 0 0.8. And with the same argument, and we also have 0 0.8 here. Yeah? So maybe then I can write down the values at each place here. So here, the value of the um, X state action value function is one because uh, um, in this state going this action uh, gives us the maximal um, the x value one because here we are in the final uh, combini um, here at 0 0.9 because we would go there and then there so if we go in this direction the best way afterwards if we go here and then we go back, the best way is to go there. So we get minus 0 0.1 and then go there. So the same we also have here. And if we are in this state and go in this direction, we lose 0 0.1. And then from there, the best way is again there. So this here is 0 0.8. And so now let's fill out again the, the rest here. 0.9 and here we are just in a in the final state okay <clears throat> so these are orange numbers are the values of the state action value function yeah and this is what we uh, we want to get in the end I mean now we uh, we calculated them because we we know the optimal uh, policy, but what we want to learn in the Q learning algorithm are these numbers here, because these are exactly the value of this function. If we know these numbers, then at each point we know where we should go, because if we are in some state, we just look in all directions and look where's the largest number, and in this direction, we go. So if we are here, then we see, oh, well, here we have a 0 0.9 and 0 0.9. So in this case, it's the same. So for example, we could go here. And if we are here, we see the largest number is there. So we could uh, go here. And then we end up there. Yeah, so this is um, what I mean by, by this formula here. If we know the values, then we can um, get the optimal policy in a certain state S by looking at all possible actions in this state and look where we have the largest value of this um, state action value function. So therefore, the goal is to find these orange numbers. And this um, is what we want to do in this Q learning algorithm because we want to learn these values of Q. And what we will do is we start with some, some random numbers or zero numbers. So that we will start with zeros everywhere. And then we will use this algorithm and this Bellman equation um, to slowly get an appro approximation for these orange numbers, yeah? So let's recall this algorithm and then we will do this algorithm step by step again in this one example. And then I hope it will become clear that we will approach slowly these orange numbers by, by using this equation here. So the goal is to find an approximation for these um, Q star values, so these orange numbers. Um, and to do so, we, we try to learn this function Q here, which gives a good approximation for this. And we start with some random values. For example, we set everything 
to be zero. And then we start at some state. And, and then we, um, uh, we look at all possible actions we can take at this state and go in the direction, or we choose the action with the currently highest um, uh, Q value. While at the beginning, maybe all of them are zero, so maybe we just choose uh, one of them. Or what we also do by a certain pr percentage is um, sometimes we just choose a random action. Yeah, this is this so-called epsilon greedy algorithm, uh, but maybe this is not, uh, not so important now. And if we do this, if we choose some action, then we will get a new state and we also get a reward. And then what we do is we update this value um, where we went by, by choosing this formula here. And so first of all, we have again, this so-called learning rate, which somehow tells us how fast do we change our mind. So we have some value in this Q uh, and now we want to update this. And what this factor alpha just tells us is um, how important this new information will be. So here we have this one minus alpha, we take the old value plus alpha and then the, the new value. So if alpha is one, then we forget completely what was the current value and we just take this number here. And if alpha is zero, then we don't change uh, anything at all. Yeah, and and maybe the tricky part is to understand uh, this thing here. Um, but but this we will see in a second. Um, so we do this, and then we will end at some state. And if this is not the terminal state, then we will go back to number three and do it again and again until we are at some, some terminal state. Okay, so let's um, do this. So now let's um, under try to understand this formula here. So why is this update using this so-called Bellman equation leads us slowly to this these orange numbers we want. So in the first uh, episode, so by, by episode, I mean, um, doing a complete run and ending at some terminal state. This will be one episode. Um, so in the first episode, let's assume we, we started everywhere by putting everywhere zero. Yeah. These are the values Q. So these are our values um, Q at these different S, S prime, uh, S two prime s3 prime and here maybe also zeros and now we choose um, some s0 so let's say this here is s0 uh, let's say s0 and um, well we start some with some s0 and now we look at the current best actions in the in this state where at this point, we look at these four numbers here, where in this case, we see all of them are the same. So we choose maybe just this action here. Yeah. So let's say um, A0, okay, let's say S0 is S and A0 is up. This here is A0. So what is the reward we get? Well, in this case, the reward we get is a minus 0 0.1. So R0 is minus 0 0.1. Yeah. So if we do this step, then this formula tells us we should update this value here. So this here is um, Q um, S0 A0, which is zero now. And the new value is, um, well, we take uh, one minus alpha times the old value, zero, plus alpha times this value here. And in this case, um, okay, let's write this out. It's zero plus alpha 
and r zero is minus zero point one plus and maybe now let's take the example where this discount is just one uh, so we don't discount at all and now what we want to do is in the new state we want to see we find, want to find the maximum of all of these values uh, but in this case the maximum is zero so in this case um, we have zero yeah so in this case um, and maybe also choose an alpha uh, or maybe not i think it will become clear so in this case we just have alpha times minus 0 0.1 so this value here will get changed to alpha times minus 0 0.1 yeah so we can already put here for the next oh maybe not so we get the new value here and now we are in this state here and so s1 in this case is s prime and again so we are we are now again in step three so um, at the current state we again try to find the, the maximum value but still here everything is zero um, but let's be lucky and maybe say um, a1 is this one here yeah so we we go in this direction here and then the reward r1 in this case is one so um, the new value here the q s um, let's say s prime so here this is a new value of q s um, up and what we get now is the new value for q s prime going left this is the old value times my one minus alpha which is zero plus alpha times the immediate reward which is one plus and in this case here again uh, the maximum value of these which is zero so zero and this gives then in the end just alpha yeah alpha. but now we are in a terminal state so this um, episode is over and the result of this episode is that now our q has the following values we have here we didn't change anything But here we have uh, minus 0 0.1 alpha and um, here we have uh, one point one times alpha yeah so now we, we do the same game and um, start maybe let's also start here and then we look in all directions and see for the maximum well in this case we wouldn't go in this direction because this here is smaller than the others and um, so maybe we would go in this direction but maybe we'll see that we get a, a minus 0 0.1 alpha here um, and then maybe go in this direction. Um, so um, maybe at one point after a few steps, all of these values will be uh, minus 0 0.1 alpha. Um, but we know the, the true value we want to have later is um, we go here minus 0 0.1 in this direction and then going one point here. Um, so, yeah, so it, for example, maybe let's make it clear with the case alpha equals one. Then here we have this and, and one. Then we already see that these two values are actually um, the correct values for Q. So if you recall, um, uh, sorry uh, so i mean this value is the correct value for q but here we now have minus zero point alpha um so maybe this we can do so if we would go in this direction and then this direction then the updated value here would be um well the old value or this reward plus and then the maximum at this case here so at this point we would add this one to the value here and would get something 
um, the value here will be this plus um, some gamma times this factor here. So therefore this value will be uh, become closer to the actual value. Yeah, I don't know if this now became clearer that um, this here somehow looks at the new state and then looks in all direction and decides um, which has the highest value. And also this gamma here, um, because it's one step ahead. So this gets a factor gamma. And then um, if from there to there, this also gets a factor gamma. This would mean that going from there two steps, we would get a factor gamma squared. And this is also what we include in this um, discounted reward. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if this helped or not. Uh, I hope. Are there any questions on this? So maybe you should play around with this notebook I gave you and maybe make the example smaller. And then maybe for each episode, look explicitly at these values or maybe even try to, to draw these values in the diagram instead of just these arrows. And then maybe uh, you will see this picture here that these numbers, um, if you do this again and again, will slowly converge to these correct orange values we want. Okay. And yeah, so then my or original idea for homework three was um, to implement this Q learning for this game and um, tic-tac-toe. Um, I don't know how you call this here. Um, maybe not like tic-tac-toe, but I think the game is clear that it's a game for two players where one player makes an X and the other makes a circle. And the goal is to get one, uh, on, get a diagonal or horizontal or a vertical line. And um, this you can also implement by using this Q learning. And the really nice thing here is um, that you, you don't need to be smart to implement I mean, of course, it's clear somehow, if you think about the game, there's an easy um, strategy um, to always win or to get a draw, so you can also um, compute it directly. But the, the nice thing about this Q learning or this reinforcement learning is um, that you really just uh, let the program try and error, and it will figure out the best strategy by itself without telling it. Of course, in these simple examples, it's faster to just implement the correct as a the perfect um, strategy. Um, and also one should say that Q learning is maybe not the best strategy for tic-tac-toe. Um, um, so one reason is because it's quite a big state space um, because what is a state here? A state is a possible board um, situation. Um, so for each entry here, so we have nine entries, there are three possible states it could be empty, X, or a circle. And um, therefore, it's uh, um, three to the nine states. Well, it's less than this because not everything could be an X, but it's roughly a three to the nine um, states. And um, so usually, you, you would not use this naive approach of this Q learning um, to attack this problem. But maybe it's a nice uh, thing for the more advanced people to try to implement this. But instead, I will present an, an easier homework three for you. But maybe if some of you implement this, maybe you can share it with the others. OK. So let's go now um, to the second part of the lecture. Namely, um, uh, we're going over here so to unsupervised learning and this clustering. So. And what is unsupervised learning? Um, well, it's like supervised learning, um, but, but without a supervisor, meaning we just get some, some data of something. And then um, our program or the machine should try to see some structure uh, in this data. Yeah. And this um, can be used in a lot of different things. So for example, uh, for example, here in, in signal separation. So if you have, for example, 
uh, um, an audio recording of um, three instruments, then um, it's the, the, the sound wave is uh, the sum of all these three different sound waves. And there are programs who can somehow figure out that in this sound wave, there are somehow three um, sources for this. And then there's a way of separating these three sources. And um, yeah, also in the anom anomaly detection. So for example, here you see a graph of the energy consumption over time. So maybe here it's um, um, day and night. And you see that uh, you usually have this graph, um, but then there's a peak. So there's something um, strange there. And this would also be an example of um, unsupervised learning to, to write an algorithm who can see that this is not normal. Yeah. And there's no, no supervising. So there's no um, feature label here. It's just a set of data points. But somehow um, we can see that this is uh, not normal here. And what we will do today is to see if we have data points like this, then um, maybe we see here that it seems that um, there are different so-called clusters um, of data points here. Um, so whatever this, this data is, we see that here somehow a cloud, there's a cloud and here. And the idea is um, to somehow find a coloring or a clustering of these data points. And the output of our algorithm will be um, something like this. So we, the input will be just numbers in R2, a collection of, a collection of points in R2. And the output will be a function which assigns to each of these points a group or a color in this case here. And this is called a clustering. OK. So and um, so more precisely, um, what we will have is we will have a subset in RD. Well, in this picture here in, in the homework, the D um, will be 2. And we have some integer k, um, which we will choose. And then later we can discuss, uh, we will discuss how to choose this k. Um, but first we will choose. So we will uh, try to find in k different clusters. So here in the picture, k is 4. And the idea is to partition this set p into four different subsets in these these so-called four clusters. So let's make this um, even more precise. So what we want to find is uh, a map, which I call small c, from this set here into the set of the numbers uh, 1 to k. Yeah, so here um, this k is 4, and these numbers just correspond to different numbers, uh, to different colors. And what this map does is each point here gets mapped to, to a color. And then what we define is um, we define the cluster CI, where I goes from 1 to k, to be all points in the corresponding cluster. So in this picture here, um, we have k equals 4. And maybe here, this is C1, C2. C3 and C4. Yeah. And then, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, so we see that um, this here is a partition of the set P. So P is a union, uh, disjoint union of these uh, CI. And um, what we want to do is, um, well, we want to do it like in this picture here. So we somehow want that uh, um, points in the same cluster are together. So this point here should not be in this cluster here. And how can we decide if, if points are um, together? Well, what we define is first for each of these cluster, we can define um, its mean. So the mean just means somehow the, the middle point um, of all these points. So what we do is 
for each of these clusters, um, we take the sum over all points in this cluster, and then uh, we divide by the number of, um, of points in this cluster. And in the picture here, this just means, um, for example, here maybe we have mu one, here maybe in the middle we have mu three, well, maybe red is not a good color here. Maybe here is mu two, and maybe here is mu um, four. Yeah. So this is by by taking the the average of all these uh, positions. And then what we want to um, to minimize. So we want to minimize the some of the distance of all these points um, to the to the mean of the corresponding cluster. And this is what, what this sum here does. So this is the so-called within cluster sum of squares. So within one cluster, we take the sum of squares. So we take, we go through all clusters and it, at each cluster, uh, we sum up all the differences of these points to the corresponding mean and take the sum of their, um, we, we take the norm, which is just a difference and square it. Yeah, so that's why the sum of squares. And this is what we want to, to minimize. Because if this point here would be in cluster C4, then in the sum, this distance here uh, would appear and this would make this sum here big. So this, if we if we can minimize this here, this really then corresponds to this picture here, um, because here the 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 teal, the teal points they have the shortest distance uh, to this one, uh, and the red points to to this one. Yeah, is this basic idea here clear? So we fix the k and we have the set p. And um, what this algorithm um, will do now is exactly try to find um, these, these, um, um, these clusters. Or more precisely, what we will find are these means. Okay, so this uh, k-means clustering algorithm is called k-means because we are trying to find these means. So, so let p a set of n elements. So in this picture here, n is 200. So we have 200 points. <clears throat> and um, we fix um, some k. And what we want to construct are the, the means of our um, future clusters. And then if we have the means, so let's say here, again, mu1, mu2, mu3, and mu4. If we have these four points, then we can define the clusters by saying a point um, looks at all these means and then looks at the shortest distance and whenever, and, and then it chooses the corresponding group. So for example, this point here is nearest to this one. Therefore, this will correspond to C1. So the statement is the CI is a set of all points um, where the distance to mu i is smaller or equal to the distance between this point P and the other means. Yeah. So therefore, if we have these means, we can also define our clusters by just saying uh, the clusters are the points which are closest uh, to the mean. And then this algorithm is quite simple. Um, so first, we start by choosing any means. So, for example, we say mu1, mu2, mu3, uh, mu4. And then uh, we, we just do the following. So if we fix some means, four points, in this case here, then we can calculate uh, the corresponding clusters. Um, so for example, here, maybe this would get this cluster, maybe this point here doesn't get a lot. Uh, maybe this one gets here something and something like this. So we might have a really small 
C here for this mu, let's say C1, C2, C3, C4. So this will give clusters. And then we can recalculate the mean. So um, for example, here in this C1, we can, if we have this cluster, we can recalculate the mean by just taking the average overall and get maybe a new mean. And here we can calculate a new mean and here a new mean and here a new mean. And this will give new mu's. And then we start again uh, at step number two. Then we have new points and for each point we can collect uh, the cluster. Then we can calculate a new mean and do it again and again. Yeah, so this is a really simple um, algorithm. And, um, but uh, at the beginning here, this initialize um, these values mu, there are also different ways um, to do this. So we will uh, discuss two of them. So um, there are two popular ways to choose these starting values. Um, so the explanation before I just uh, choose random points uh, in the plane, um, but there's a so-called uh, Forge method uh, which is named after uh, some guy. And th the idea here is to choose these means to be one of these data points. Yeah, so what, what we do is we choose of these, in this case, 200 points, we just choose four points randomly and then say, these are our um, starting means. This is one way. So for example, here in this picture, um, maybe we choose this point here for the first mean, which gives this teal part here. And maybe we choose this one here to get this part here. And then we maybe also choose this one to get this part and maybe this point to get this part here. Um, so this gives these um, four clusters. And another way is to just um, put each of these points in, in a random cluster at the beginning. So we just choose this, um, this cluster function or this coloring randomly at the beginning. And then with this, I mean, with a really messed up cluster here, we can calculate for each of these numbers, we can calculate the mean. And this, if you see this picture here, this will lead to the fact that most of the means here will be quite in the center um, of this picture here. Yeah, so these are two different um, starting points um, for choosing these uh, um, starting mu's. And then we just uh, repeat this algorithm. And in this case here, so this is um, the picture. So we, in this case, I choose this test data here. Then here, this is what I get with this method. And this is what I get with this method. And in this case here, after doing this um, 20 times, in the end, um, I get this result here, which um, is what we maybe uh, might expect in this example. Yeah. So both of them actually lead to the same um, result in this case. OK. And the homework is to implement uh, this here. Um, so this here comes from my implementation and I, um, but um, you can please feel free to implement it however you want. Um, but for those who are not so sure how to implement this, um, I also created a template. Um, so the, the homework three, which I will share in a second, um, is to implement this algorithm and then also try to think about the following questions, which you maybe have now in mind. Uh, because I said we, we fix the K by ourselves, um, but maybe we want our program to decide what is the correct uh, K. And, um, but maybe you can try to figure out maybe how you can use this here um, um, to, to find the correct K. So the basic idea is to, um, to consider this, um, this value here. I mean, I can do this algorithm for different case. So I can start with k equals one, do this algorithm. And in the end, I get a value for this 
within cluster sum of squares, which will give me a number. And then I can do this algorithm again with k equals two, and I get an another number. So the, the idea is that you can try for different k's, plot what you get um, for this within cluster sum of squares. And of course, if you increase k, if you allow to have more clusters, then this number becomes um, smaller and smaller. Um, but you will see that um, in this case here, for example, where the, maybe the real answer is four clusters, that at this point, let's say four, um, before four, you will maybe really increase the value, but after four, there's not really a big um, decrease, oh, sorry, not increase, I mean decrease. Uh, after four, we, we don't really make this value much lower than before. So if you, if you plot these within cluster sum of squares with respect to the number of clusters, um, then the way to decide which is a, the nice K is a point where this curve is maybe not really uh, going down much more. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, um, you should maybe play around with your implementation and see what is the difference between these two um, way of starting with the algorithm. And um, so first, what I give you here is um, a way to create some uh, some data, so you don't need to uh, program 200 points by yourself. Um, so there's a, uh, a package, a scalearn, which also includes some function, but um, there we can also have a function which creates us some data. So there's a function called make blobs, which is somehow the, it starts with creating clusters um, of a certain uh, standard deviation. So it maybe becomes clear if I do just an example here. So let me run this code here. So in this case here, I choose a uh, number of clusters four. Um, the dimension is two. And here the standard deviation is 1.5. Um, so if I change this number and make it bigger, let's say three, this just means that these clusters become uh, wider. Um, so if I run this again, oops, then you will see now, well, these are still four clusters, but it's more spread. And um, with this function, so the, the, the positions of the points are then uh, here in this array points. And also uh, we can actually get back the, the clusters this, this uh, function used. So in this case, um, we can first just plot these points, but by using again this, uh, this uh, PLT, which we also used before. There's this scatter pl plot, which just um, pl plots these points. And then we can also use um, these uh, clusters used by this function. So these were the four functions created by this, as uh, these were these four clusters created by this function. Um, but this you can maybe just ignore at the beginning. Um, so the point is that this function here just gives you some, some test data. And you can also increase here the number of um, clusters, let's say eight, and maybe decrease the standard deviation. And then we see here we have uh, eight clusters, uh, which are a little bit tighter. Yes? So you have this, this data in this, uh, in this array points. And then here I just um, I recall this, the content of the lecture today, or what I mean by cluster and this within cluster sum of squares and what we mean by a mean of a cluster CI. And then here is a, uh, this algorithm I described. And the exercise is then um, to implement um, this algorithm. So um, what we want is we want to find this function um, which assigns to each of these points a number. And um, so again, you, you don't need to use this template here. You can implement it however you want. Um, but how I did it is I said the, the clusters is just an array of numbers. 
So n here is the, uh, the number of points we got before. And then uh, in these clusters, which starts with zero, you will later maybe put in the, the corresponding uh, cluster. So this will be a, a number between zero and three in this case. And um, so this area means contains these mu one up to mu k, and these clusters are um, the clusters. Yeah, so in this is in the algorithm, you will update um, these clusters and you will update um, the, the means. So what you want to change is uh, always this area and this area here. Yeah, and, and then for these two ways of starting, you should implement this function, uh, this foggy method and this random method. Um, so this will, both of these function should change this. Oh, there's a question. So the, the question is, um, if I start with the foggy method or the a random partition method if I always end up in the same result? And the answer is actually no. So if you play around with this, you will see that, um, um, I mean, in the one example I showed you, it, they both found the same clustering, um, but you will see that in, in general, you, will, you can end up with uh, different results. So thank you for this question. Um, but yeah, so one part of the homepage uh, homework is then also to play around. So maybe I can show you one example here. So this is my uh, finished implementation. So let's, oh, maybe let, let me create a new set. Um, okay. So let me do with a random so here, um, even though k is four, um, if we start with a um, with the random partition, um, then maybe uh, um, how to say? So maybe one um, mean is outside here, and the other means are inside. And then in the next step of deciding in which cluster they are actually uh, we will just get the three clusters in the end and if we use this foggy method with the same data set um, then we actually see that um, these well the result here is not nice because i forced him to do four clusters um, you see that the foggy method gives these four clusters in this example here um, so i hope this answers your question and you see that um, actually we get two different results here. So these are exactly, they started with the exactly same uh, data set at the beginning. But maybe here taking k equals four, uh, even though our example function, our create, our create function uh, used for, uh, I think clearly here we have just have two clusters. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, so for each of these steps, uh, what I did is just implement um, these functions here, update these means. Um, so this is just this function here and also choose the clusters, which is just here. So if I have means, then I can assign for each point, I can assign in which cluster it should be. And um, where this function here, I just gave you the, um, this within cluster sum of squares um, so this just takes a sum over all um, differences between the points and the means. And then after you implemented these steps here, um, um, you can see here these uh, k-means algorithm uh, with a random partition. So here's just the, the uh, initializing part is different. And here, this is just the drawing part. And this here is just the algorithm which does step two, step three, and then it goes back and does this again and again. And the only difference here is uh, step one. And then um, the bonus exercise um, is to maybe try to decide uh, which K is maybe the best for a given data set. So in this example here, oh, in this example here, 
maybe the answer to this should be k equals two. Um, so maybe, so what I explained before, what you should do for this is then try to plot um, this WCSS um, compared with the k and then see that after increasing the k, of course it will always go down because the optimal k is uh, setting k equals n, putting each point in its own cluster, then the difference is always zero. Uh, but if you plot this, you will see that at some point um, it will not really uh, get much, much better. So maybe somehow the derivative of this function, um, if it's um, smaller than a certain number, then at this point you should not increase the k anymore. Yeah, so, but yeah, so maybe here you can find, maybe you can even make it automatically uh, that your program decides the k. Uh, but one way to do this is just to plot it and then maybe decide by hand which is the best k. Okay. And yeah, I think that's all for the homework. So I hope this homework will come online in the coming hours. And then I will let you know, and then maybe you can discuss it in the <clears throat> study session tomorrow. But first I will stop sharing and then you can ask questions.